1923, and through streets of Brooklyn, American soldiers are on the march again. But this time, they are not marching as to war, for the only weapons they shoulder are banners, demanding payment of bonus for services in World War I. Bonus champion Senator Royal S. Copeland attracts willing listeners in front of Brooklyn's Borough Hall. But President Harding turns a deaf ear to this group of representatives who call at White House to plead for payment. Yet bonus war continues, with another booster soon to be Vice President Charles Curtis. Then, December 1924, Brigadier General Frank Hines signs bonus certificate, ensuring full payment by 1945. But veterans won't wait for that seemingly distant date. Early in 1930s in New York City, there's renewed agitation for payment, not only in full, but fast. Third presidential veto of bonus bill adds explosive fuel to already blazing boom for bonus money now. And warriors of World War I need it too. For millions of jobs have been lost in the bottomless barrel of depression. Out of work and broke, doughboys want paychecks for job they did in 1917. They march on the nation's capital from every state in the Union. At base of Washington Monument, they gather from four corners of country. By June 11, 1932, 15,000 are congregated around towering obelisk on tent-covered acres reminiscent of training camps of long past pre-war days. They're in the army all over again. As in shadow of capital, bonus marchers check in, each one hungry to get his check out of government. Harris administration gives helping hand, however. Army gear is given to each veteran who made the march. Cots, bedding, and mess equipment are doled out to men grateful for meals and place to sleep. Farmers, laborers, office workers from east, west, north, and south, they're all veterans of French battlefields. Now, veterans of the Bonus Expeditionary Force, besieging Washington. Main tent is nerve center of encampment. Bonus Army headquarters where impatient marchers get words of hope from their leaders. But words they are repeating over and over are, give us our money now. With invasion of Washington, first mission of march is accomplished. Now target is White House. 15,000 strong, they drive to heart of the nation's capital, straight to gates of the presidential mansion. And then chosen delegates of bonus marchers and various veterans organizations enter the White House to settle their complaint. Then January 27, 1936, the Patman bonus bill is signed. Passed by both houses over presidential veto, political hot potato of four administrations, the bonus bill becomes law and veterans tab on World War I is paid in full. It's August 1924, and President Calvin Coolidge signs family heirloom as he plays host to such notables as Thomas Edison, Harvey and Russell Firestone, and magnet Henry Ford. Following the chief executive's lead, Ford signs the ancient sap bucket too. While Edison proves his original movie camera works, Hostess at historic gathering is Grace Coolidge, first lady of the land. Scandinavians on ice. It's March 1928, and at San Moritz, Norwegians are showing the way in the Winter Olympics. Here's number 77 giving his fellow ski jumper something to shoot at. Well, that should be something to leap at. And don't look before you leap or you won't do it. Good jump and good jumper. Toms of Norway, Olympic champ in 24, falls out of competition this time. His crown goes to fellow Norwegian, Anderson. The winner and new champion, Anderson. In women's figure skating division, Beatrix Lochran of New York looks as if she might be a winner. And she's among the winners, but she isn't first. Figure skating crown goes to a 16-year-old girl. Guess who it is? Well, look who it is. 
Yes, you're right, it's little Sonia Henney, some years before she brought her silver skates to America and turned them into gold. She wins here, again in 1932, again in 1936, and will always be the queen of skaters everywhere. Thank you.